Hello, everyone. This is Sebastian Bay. I am the faculty advisor for the Georgetown University Wargaming Society. We are incredibly uh, honored and pleased to have Peter Perla, um, a famous designer and a good colleague of mine, to present uh, his thoughts on Wargaming the Path from 1940 to 2040. For those who are new to our webinar series, um, you will be off Zoom and uh, off video and off audio for the presentation. If you have any chats or comments, or questions for our speaker, please put them in your chat in the chat box. And I'll make sure to address them um, as Peter takes uh, breaks for questions. Um, and Peter Perla is a man who needs no introduction, but I will try to do his very impressive resume justice. He has been involved in gaming, both hobby and professionally for over 50 years. He has done extensive work at the Center for Naval Analysis or CNA uh, for quite a long time. And he has produced several titles including a recent title uh, for a Napoleonic game called uh, on Austerlitz, which I will put in the chat. Um, and Peter, I hand it over to you. Okay, thanks, Seb. So uh, my, my plan is to go through the presentation and not stop for questions and we can address the questions at the end. This is sort of a story and so it needs to be told uh, as a story from start to finish. So let me just start by saying that it's a think piece. And the ideas here are my opinions mixed with a dollop of facts, and it's targeted at gamers, especially current and future game designers, not at strategists of either the political or military type. That said, let me start with how I intend to use the terms strategy, tactics, and operations here based on something I wrote a long time ago in a CNA study. Strategy defines what we think we need to do to achieve the kind of victory we want. Tactics describes how we expect to fight and defeat the enemy when encountered. And operations concerns itself with how we can arrange campaigns as sequences of maneuvers and battles in such a way that we can win the battles when we fight, avoid the battles we don't want to fight, and in so doing, we advance toward our strategic objective. If we're going to prepare the nation to win a major war or even a minor war, regardless of the circumstances or our national objectives and the objectives of our adversaries, we need to do better at integrating our thinking about warfare from the strategic to the tactical to the operational. And we need to do it in a way that allows us to leverage our people equipment and doctrine to respond effectively to an uncertain future, one in which our adversaries may not follow the scripts we are so fond of using to optimize our capabilities. Wargamers and wargaming can play useful roles in helping us integrate strategy, tactics, and operations to achieve well thought out strategic objectives in a conflict whose ultimate nature we may not be able to predict with geometric logic. A year or two ago, I finally got around to reading the book, The Blitzkrieg Legend by Karl Heinz Frieser. This book analyzes the 1940 German campaign in France and the Low Countries. As the title implies, it is a debunking of the idea that Blitzkrieg was a revolutionary new concept. As is so often the case with war gamers, reading the book caused me to dig out games and more books on the subject. So I went into my game, I was gonna say game library, but that's probably not quite the right way to describe it, my game pile and dug up a bunch of games and started fooling around with them. Ultimately, this led me to design 
a game on the first big tank battle of the war at Hanu, Belgium. When Seb asked me to speak here this evening, I thought that I might leverage my thinking into an interesting discussion of some ideas I've been kicking around. I think that the 1940 campaign illustrates my notion of the interweaving of strategy, tactics, and operations. It also illuminates the role that wargaming can play in achieving success across the board. To wit, the Germans, at least the far-sighted ones, recognized that victory against the French had to be defined by the destruction of their fielded forces and the occupation of Paris. I'm not gonna get into all the complex political goals and ideas motivating Hitler, but this initial campaign was all about achieving this complete military victory and dictating the resultant peace from a position of dominance. This meant that to avoid the bloody stalemate of 1914 through 1918, the Germans would need to fight a battle of annihilation against the French and British armies, but do so without engaging in a prolonged attritional struggle. The innovative battle leaders such as Guderian and Rommel concluded that this would demand that tactically, the German forces would have to penetrate the frontier defenses and exploit rapidly to the rear areas. So they used wargaming and training exercises to prepare their troops carefully in the techniques needed to defeat fortifications, seize river crossings, and drive relentlessly into rear areas. The campaign was structured to exploit these capabilities and draw the allies into a sort of reverse Schlieffen plan, luring them into Belgium and then encircling them from the south and west rather than from the north and west. Then once that campaign was successful, the Germans redeployed to inflict the coup de grace across the Somme and through the Maginot Line to break the remaining resistance of the French military, occupy Paris and dictate the surrender. The major insights I took from my research into the 1940 campaign center around the contrast between German balance and allied stumbling. At the most fundamental level, the Germans had a realistic strategic vision and a theory of victory for the kind of war they thought they could win. They implemented their concept through operational brilliance by key leaders to win at acceptable cost. This brilliance depended on their tactical proficiency, which was in turn based on sufficient, but not dominant technology and on excellent leadership. They ensured this leadership through intense leader training, integrating tactical and operational wargaming with realistic and targeted field problems and exercises. The main thing I'm thinking is that from my admittedly limited perspective, we in the US may be spending an inordinate level of effort at gaming what we like to call the operational level of war without the necessary balance of effort on the strategic and tactical levels. My focus today is on the tactical level. The Halsey Alpha Group at Naval War College is working in great detail and at highly classified levels, and especially on the possibility of an air naval battle in the Pacific against China. 
But what about general denser classifications or unclassified work? What are the tactical vignettes likely to comprise the operational schema that can lead to the victory defined by our strategy? Any such strategy must include a definition of what constitutes victory. And this definition must be more broad and more clear than the tautology that we win when we have defeated the enemy. There is frequent reference in DOD to fighting a battle to defeat enemy anti-access area denial forces in the Western Pacific, for example. What I have seen in open sources smacks of overtones of war plan orange prior to World War II. Just to be clear, I have been um, not really working full time at CNA for so, uh, three or four years now, and I've hardly done any at all classified work for the, in fact, none for the last two years. So most of this stuff is based on unclassified sources in conversations with folks like Larry Bond and Chris Carlson, who are also working in the unclassified area. But if we're looking at War Plan Orange, the ideas of the current strategies sometimes resonate the same way. The fleet will gather in a mighty force supported by land-based US Air Force and the US Marine Corps and drive into enemy waters where it will fight and win a decisive battle. Then victory! But what sort of victory? Destruction of the Chinese fleet? Elimination of their bases in the South China Sea? At what cost? Can we really achieve even those goals at acceptable risk and affordable cost? But winning such a battle, even in this fairly limited concept, will require more than just swatting down enemy missiles. Because at the very least, we probably don't want to get into a contest of Lanchestrian attrition any more than did the 1940 Germans. Their victory was based not on technical domination of the battlefield to outgun the enemy, but rather on the integration of technology, tactics, and training, what I'm calling the three T's to victory. That is what enabled them to win when they had to fight, avoid fighting when they could neutralize their opponents without doing so, and create decisive operational outcomes, which led to achieving their well-defined strategic objectives, and so procuring victory. The 1940 German Wehrmacht had the advantage on us. They were faced with a tangible enemy in a well-defined strategic, tactical, and operational environment. Today, we face uncertainties across all those areas. In 1940, the tactical challenges were largely clear. Cross difficult terrain rapidly assault river lines defended by bunkers supported by artillery, move armor over the rivers and deep into the enemy artillery zone to disrupt their response and keep moving so as never to present a fixed and known target. They did what they could to improve their technology particularly by adding armor to many of their tanks after the Polish campaign. They improved their tactics and training by using war games and exercises to work out the key steps in their approach 
and to improve the integration of their air and armor to an extent unseen even in Poland. Trusting to their tactics and training and to the innovative operational concepts of a relatively junior General von Manstein, they raced their way to a sudden, surprising, and as so often described, a strange strategic defeat for the Allies, or at least for France, the main enemy at the time. In the current and future environment, we are not quite so well grounded in reality. We postulate many different potential adversaries and modes of conflict, from renewed threats of terrorists and insurgency to gray zone conflicts with the likes of a still strong and dangerous, if temporarily caged, Russian bear, to the perceived incipient and global threat of a strong, focused, and increasingly assertive China. The applicable, applicable tactics similarly range from our recent experience in counterinsurgency to the black arts of cyber war and information warfare in general, to the integration of air, space, and naval power in a multi-domain Pacific Ocean conflict. This latter conflict presents technical, tactical, and training problems not dissimilar to those faced by the Army Air Force and the US Navy in the decade preceding Pearl Harbor. To take a page from the German experience in 1940, what do today's operators think are the specific tactical, operational, and campaign design issues that they can work on with a combination of at-sea tests, exercises, and games. In the research I undertook for my book over 30 years ago now, I saw the Navy's efforts during the decade that same philosophy at work in the German army of 1940. The recognition that new technologies and weapons of aircraft, aircraft carriers, submarines, and replenishment at sea were imposing new obstacles and creating new opportunities superimposed on the enduring geographic and strategic realities of war in the Pacific. The integration of training, exercising, wargaming and analysis, all focused on the solution of the tactical problems to be faced in conducting the campaigns needed to win strategic victory, help the United States recover from the Pearl Harbor disaster and innovate and adapt new concepts of operation based on the actual resources available. These innovations advanced the evolving strategic goals of isolating Japan from its needed resources and penetrating its defensive ring to enable striking directly at the home islands. This, his, this history led me to articulate the thing of my, about my work that is most often cited, the concept of the cycle of research. So to me, it's time, indeed well past time, to reinvigorate the cycle of research. The post-war emphasis on systems analysis derived from economic techniques and the almost warlike concentration on acquiring systems and technologies continues to dominate the senior levels of the Pentagon. This whiz kid realignment of expertise and influence resulted in the downplaying of both operations research based on real world data and of wargaming based on data and military expertise. We came to place too much emphasis 
on precious and fragile technical advantages, which we are losing at all too rapid a rate. At the same time, we seem to be floundering in a strategic morass, struggling to articulate clear operational and strategic objectives and theories of victory for potential conflicts. Even those we might reasonably foresee, not to mention those we may not. These were not problems faced by the US Navy during the 1930s or the German Wehrmacht in 1940. We do not have the luxury of thinking we understand the nature of our enemy and of the conflict we need to prepare most to confront. These uncertainties, these complexities demand even more of us today than back then. So our programs of study, analysis, and planning need to be even more thorough and more comprehensive. These are only some of the reasons that we need to reinvigorate the cycle of research. To integrate all our analytical and scientific tools with intense tactical training and development, to understand better the technologies and systems our scientists and engineers are developing. To learn how the human warriors who must command and use those tools can hope best to exploit their capabilities and overcome their shortcomings. And if we professional war gamers are to play our important part in this process of learning, experimentation, and exploitation, we ourselves need to set in motion a cycle of our own. A new cycle of wargaming, integrated with and turning in tandem with a wider cycle of research. As I ponder these issues, it struck me that we need to think of future war games in at least three dimensions. We need simple games to illustrate basic concepts, as well as complex games to explore how things really work. We need unclassified games to educate Congress, students, and military amateurs, and classified games to teach and learn from military professionals. Finally, we need strategic games to think through conflicts and theories of victory. Tactical games to create and experiment with innovative technology and training. And operational games to fit together the three T's to victory. Yes, as many of us have been arguing for years, we need better operational level gaming to explore options and obstacles and to help instruct our near-term prospective military and civilian leaders about the problems they may have to deal with in any conflict. We also need better and more challenging games at the strategic level, confronting officials and officers with creative thinking opponents who are free to improvise, to riff off of official projections, to explore unexpected and even unforeseen adversary goals and behaviors. And finally, we need to develop more creative games at the tactical level to incorporate the best available information from models and simulations about technologies and their employment as well as real world insights about how systems and especially the people who must decide when, where and how to employ them perform in the messy environment of the competitive real world, not in the pristine environment of docile silicon chips. There are long-term efforts underway to leverage such tactical gaming pioneered by the Halsey groups at the Naval War College, as I mentioned earlier. Look out, here it comes. 
Obviously, war games and war gamers alone cannot do everything that is needed. But we can take the lead in refocusing our own efforts to help point the way forward. To that end, rather than leave you with just another Perla call to arms, let me propose a tang tangible task to challenge you. Several years ago, the Navy started an initiative to produce a game based on the video game of Madden's football. The Madden game allowed players to build their own football plays and run them out against opposition. The Navy's idea was to give young sailors and JOs a tool to develop and explore innovative tactics much as the video game allowed its players to create new football plays. Several efforts resulted from this initiative. Chris Kona's and Paul Weber's Fleet Battle School being perhaps the most prominent. This was a computerized and highly detailed representation of what I would be inclined to call, inclined to call grand tactics. It also came in a board game version. Unfortunately, that effort did not receive the funding it needed to push it forward to its ultimate vision. So I'm wondering if an even simpler game somewhere in the middle ground might not be a worthwhile effort. What I envision is a game that can be embodied, embodied as a tabletop board game or a tablet computer game or both, targeted at both civilian and military schoolhouses, but also at serving operators to help them think about the profession of arms and about the tactical decisions they might face should they be in combat. The kind of game, in fact, that would be fun both for hobbyists and instructive for professionals. Easier said than done. In his comments to an early draft of these remarks, a colleague of mine from CNA, Barry Messina, clearly articulated some of the technical problems we face. We need to identify the knowns systems we have high confidence that we can correctly portray in a game. The knowable systems we know exist, but need to develop engineering level sets of assumptions. The assumable systems we expect and can make reasonable assumptions about. And where we need fundamental data to even begin to develop guesses about assumed performance. How can the wargaming community distill the needed engineering level information to build in a series of reasonable models to actually design and run games that are close enough to get meaningful insights? Models of the future can only be verified internally as self-consistent, but cannot be validated unless actually trying to represent only current events, not future ones. Jim Donegan liked to say, if you can't predict the past, you can't predict the future. When he talked about the, the importance of using wargaming techniques to understand past conflicts so that they could help you model future conflicts. The problem is that as the future gets farther and farther away from us, understanding and modeling the past isn't always going to help that much. War games and models are easiest when focused on the near future using systems and capabilities that really exist and played by people 
who will most likely have to employ them if war comes. These models can use past experience and current practice to produce understandable and acceptable results without straightjacking players into blind acceptance. But the technical is only one of the three T's. It forms the foundation for creating and using new games to help develop new tactics and train new warfighters in both the new and existing ways of fighting. And so let me return to the insights from 1940. The German tanks were not the greatest in firepower or armor, but they were good enough that when combined with their tactics and training, they were sufficient to win out over the technically superior allied units. What you see here on the slide is a comparison of the probably the two best medium tanks in 1940. On the left is the French Samoa S-35, called a cavalry tank. It had heavier armor than the Panzer III on the right. It had a bigger and more effective gun than the Panzer III. <coughs> And it was in many ways faster than the Panzer III. What was different was the Panzer III operated on the basis of teamwork. Teamwork within the tank itself. You can see there's a three person turret on the Panzer III, and there's a single lone and unafraid tank commander running the turret on the Samoa. Not very effective at managing the battle and firing the weapon. On top of that, all the Panzer III's had radios to communicate with their platoons and their companies and their battalions. The Samoas, only a few of them had radios. And so their ability to command and control formations was far less than the Germans. And so the Germans were able to take advantage of their command and control to put their tanks in positions to defeat the better tanks of the French. Looking to the future then, we have to figure out what will be the minimum thresholds of capability future weapon systems must cross to enable tactical success? How can our games empower operators to develop tactical employment concepts adapted to both those capabilities and the performance of the people who must employ them? What are the tactics we need to develop as the numbers of systems, platforms, sensors, networks, command and decision processes, and so forth, keep growing. A naval force at sea has to have support from onboard sensors connected over multiple networks through several different command and decision and processing facilities for both defensive and offensive fires. How do our games describe and represent such new tactics? And of course, how can wargaming help the military train to use the new technologies and new tactics effectively in new and uncertain situations? Finally, how can games help both civilian and military leaders develop a clear vision about what it takes to use the people and their weapons to defeat the enemy with minimal loss and achieve decisive success quickly. As was the case in the past, so it is likely that future victory will be based not on technological domination alone, but rather on the integration of technology, 
tactics, and training. The three T's to victory. War games have a vital role to play in educating our operators and leaders about the need for such a process of integration and in aiding its evolution. That is the challenge I would like to place before you budding game designers out there. Have at it. Over to you, Seb. Hey, thank you, Peter. Uh, we have some questions in the chat and I'll let, uh, I'll give everyone a moment to uh, furiously type their questions to you. So our first question that I have to you is quite long, so bear with me. Um, it says, if we don't have a good grasp on what the likely catalyst for the conflict is, and thus what the initial stakes of the conflict are, how can we reliably create strategic war games to test strategy and theories of victory for said conflict? I'll ask that portion first. There's a second part as well. Well, about the only thing you can do, right, is you can postulate different, shall we put it, different situations. I don't like to use the word scenario here, but what are the what are the fundamental goals of the United States, if we have them? And what are the obstacles to our achieving those goals? And who do we think might want to get in our way of achieving our strategic objectives? Then you can postulate a whole range of things where the different adversaries might be involved in some sort of a conflict. But it's all about creative thinking and telling stories about what the future might look like. There's no simple answer to that. And we can't articulate every possible scenario. All we can do is, is come up with sensible things that we think are going to be obstructing our goals and, and explore how they might play out using games. Does that answer that question? Uh, I believe so. So the next question, uh, next part of that question is, particularly given that outcomes are inherently a political determination, and if we don't have a good understanding of that said strategy, how can we know if the tactical results will connect to the strategic ends? Well, so if, if you talk about the political, political objectives and political attitudes and things like that, the, the techniques that were used back in the early days of the Cold War of palm mill gaming, which actually originated in the 20s, those are your best hope, right? Where you, you get people to play other people because people are the best way to simulate the behavior of people. And so if you can construct a decent set of ideas and goals and turn them loose on human beings, they will come up with ways of achieving the objectives. And if part of those ways include military conflict, then you can postulate what kinds of military conflicts might occur and what types of tactical combinations might be required to succeed in them. So, I mean, there's the answer to those questions is you, you, you do it. You, you have to be creative and solve the problems that you're faced with. I wish I could tell you, uh, you know, here's the equation. It doesn't exist. So the next question is, is the problem we have, have uh, having with designing games that we are attempting to integrate two different types of learning at once rather than focusing on one or the other? Is the purpose of the game to provide a low road transfer game of training responses to stimuli versus a high road transfer of key concepts and a generation of new ideas? Well, th those are both laudable goals and, and the, the particular game is designed to achieve one or the other of those, but it, you're right, it's very difficult to produce a, a simple game of concepts that also teaches the procedures of 
actual use of actual systems and capabilities. So yeah, you, you've got to decide what are you, what is really your objective for the game and focus the game on achieving that objective, whether it's complex or simple. So actually, I'm going to take the facilitator's uh, prerogative and ask a follow-up to that question is, so you mentioned a couple of times about German tactical gaming and how it helped them build better leadership and operational brilliance that you know, made a difference in, in the early part of the war. Could you talk more about those tactical games and what they were like and how they were used in the German army? Um, yeah, sure. The, uh, one of the slides had a picture of uh, a little booklet that is uh, the Kriegspiel Feeble. It, that's the, uh, the handbook of uh, war games. And um, that, that has, an ex has a lot of examples of the way they, they were doing their thinking and executing games at the low levels, at the tactical levels in the 1930s. And they, they made an interesting distinction between what they called the tabletop exercise and the war game. The tabletop exercise was designed to teach the junior leaders the skills necessary to think through tactical problems and to address the tactical problems in ways that were consistent with what the, the army understood the solutions, the best solutions to be. Not that they were teaching the school solution, but they were, they were designed to help the instructor put the, put the participants, in a sense, they were one-sided games, very much like um, any sort of a, a, I was gonna say a matrix game, but that's the wrong, wrong description. The way those things worked was the, the, the student would be given a, typically a sketch map of a situation and background on what their mission is. So it, it's build, building on the original von Reiswitz Kriegsville concepts, they would get a uh, overall idea of what the mission of their higher order unit was. And then they were given a tactical task. So for example, a platoon command would be given the company mission within the context of the battalion and then their job was to take the hill or capture the, the machine gun nest. And they would work through the, uh, their, the way they would deploy and move their squads using game-like pieces on the, on the terrain map. So that, but the instructor was the one playing the, the opposing side. And basically it was like asking questions. Um, so we, we can we see we see the same sort of thing. At least I remember them from the from days gone by in the Marine Corps Gazette, the tactical decision games that they used to publish in the Marine Corps Gazette. So that was the that was the, the tabletop exercise and the, the the war game. The both sides were played by students, with the instructor being the facilitator and the umpire. The idea there being to give the students the experience of facing an, another human decision maker who had their own ideas about how they should deal with the situation. So that they, they used both of those techniques to help the, help the students get an idea of how, how would, should things work? What is the right way of doing standard tasks? And then, here's a situation and you've learned the standard task, but now what happens if your opponent does something you didn't expect? How do you deal with that? So those are the sort of two branches of that same task. So yeah, uh, tactical decision games are great. I, I use them in my class at Georgetown and, and at the Academy. Um, so moving on to the next question, which I promise I did not plant. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Someone has asked, have you had a chance to review Rand's Hegemony um, game that was made available for commercial sale last year? What are its strengths and its limitations in your opinion? And I swear I did not put this in the chat, I swear. 
Well, this one is easy. He said, the answer is no, I haven't had a chance to play it. So, so there you have, go. <laughs> I don't have any good points or bad points. It must be great. Um, but for those who are interested about uh, hegemony, uh, Yuna Wong and Mike Linick gave a presentation to Goose last year about it, which can be found on our YouTube page as well. Um, next question is, so in a naval context, working from the tactical level up to uh, up as a contribution to the effort, can we set up games of one combatant ship versus another, then work up variations such as air-to-air -air combat games do, the result then feeding into thinking about more complex encounters? Uh, yeah, sure. That, the answer is, is certainly. Um, if, you, if you think back on... I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the old Harpoon miniatures game system, which has evolved over decades um, into both a uh, continuing miniatures version as well as uh, electronic versions. Um, the, the, the idea there is you can represent individual ships or aircraft or small groups or large groups. And um, so, the, the tricky part about modern naval warfare is that the, the old idea of, of what, you know, the one ship versus one ship, that, that has a very limited scope. The problem is, yeah, it's a limited scope. When are you going to encounter, you know, one ship with your, 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 your destroyer commander? When are you going to have to deal with a, a, an enemy destroyer on its own? Why are you? you're generally gonna be part of a big battle group. The problem is if you run into a situation where you're alone and unafraid on some, uh, how shall I put it, a, a forward position and you run into a missile boat, such as we've seen in the, in the um, Persian Gulf and you don't know how to fight your ship without all the support of the battle force and the aircraft and the, and the overhead sensors and all that stuff, then that poor little missile boat that probably costs a 10th of what your ship does is liable to put a hole in you. So it, it all, it's all tied together. If you don't know how to fight your ships, you're gonna have trouble fighting your groups. And, and if you have trouble fighting your groups, you're gonna have trouble fighting your fleets. It's a tactical building block, right? You have to build the tactics. Back in the, in the late 90s, there was a big stink about naval officers being incapable of fighting their ships. I haven't been tracking what the latest is, but I'm assuming that there, that hasn't improved a whole lot. Hopefully it has, but I don't know that it has. So, uh, Peter, the next question is actually from Stephen Downs Martin. How do no, we? No. <laughs> uh, just a fair bit of warning. Um, how do we, starting now, war game to author the future, i.e., create a future favorable to us instead of trying to predict the future, then war game in that predicted future? How, I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? I, I didn't quite follow it. Oh yeah, no worries. Uh, how do we, starting now, war game to author the future instead of, I'm assuming. Oh, oh. Okay, author was the word I missed. All right. Um, well, that's a, that is a good question. And of course, I don't have the final answer to that, but I do have some ideas. And those ideas are things along the lines of, let's take our understanding of what the current situation is and get as many ideas as we can from as many people as we can to describe what they think the future should look like and start building games that explore how that future can be achieved. This calls to mind some of the ideas of Russell Ackoff in his discussion of um, planning, um, trying to, the, the corporate, what was the name of that paper? The, the corporate rain dance. He talked about reactive planning and proactive planning and his basic idea of the, the way to proceed was what he called interactive planning. 
And I, I was always impressed by Yakov's ideas here. And I, I, I mentioned this before in other, pa other papers, but the idea is to try to get a broad perspective from, in this case, let's say junior officers enlisted mid-grade battle group officers and even flags, get everybody thinking about, hey, here's where we are now as far as naval warfare goes. Where do we wanna go in the future? So that we can start seeing ideas because everything depends on ideas. The more ideas you get, the more chances you have of coming up with a good one. You have to sort through them, of course, but gaming is a great way of doing that. This was one of the things why, the, the reasons why I was so disappointed that the Madden football concept didn't go farther because I kept thinking there are games, I think one of the pictures I had on that slide was Hornet Leader, uh, um, old board game from uh, GMT in which the players represented the commanders of an FA-18 squadron on board a carrier. And the idea is that you figure out how you're gonna use your forces your, your pilots, your planes, your weapon systems to accomplish an idea. And I thought that, that that was a great structure for building a game in which people could come up with their own new tactics. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that something like that can, can still take place and we can get ideas from the, the whole waterfront as the Navy likes to call it, from, from the, the lowly sailor down in the, in the uh, combat information center who's playing war games in, in the dark in, in, uh, in his room to the, uh, the, the full up Naval War College facility. So again, using facilitator prerogative, I want to follow up on that question uh, in the sense of how do we get gaming down to the tactical edge, you know what I mean? Currently, wargaming sort of concentrated at the policy, the strategic and operational level and sort of places like the PME schools and uh, FFRDCs. How do we get it to the units engaging on regular wargaming sort of at, like the Germans did? Well, I think that, that there are a couple routes there. Um, the easiest route is to create simple, challenging, fun games on a commercial basis that sailors can buy and play. Then you, you can try to penetrate the training facilities, the training schools, the schoolhouses, and include a, a, uh, a gaming component in professional military education, not just for officers, but certainly for, for the senior non-commissioned officers and incorporate the kind of games that I talked about with the tactical decision games and the tabletop games to, install, to uh, allow instructors to use the games to communicate the information effectively to the students. The problem in the past and today, for that matter, is that hobby games, hobbyist games, let me call them that, hobbyist games, are not designed for normal human beings. They're not designed for, for naval trainers. They're designed for hobbyists who understand the, the years of, of uh, tropes and uh, abstractions that you need to understand to be able to grasp very complex rules that differ dramatically from the way you think in the real world. The, the hobby games are artificial, right? The players need to have some sort of a, a schema or a structure a scaffolding to understand how to play those games. Real officers and, and sailors, keeping the Navy uh, setting there, they don't have that scaffolding. 
what you need to do is you need to translate the game into the scaffolding they have. How do they actually think about doing what they do? That's the hard part. And it's probably easiest with a simple game because a simple game is a, a, a mechanism that you can layer things onto. As the students and the instructors get more proficient with understanding how to use it. Peter, uh, that part about wargaming for enlisted that spoke to my soul. So I, yes, 100% yes on that. <laughs> uh, the next question sort of follows up to your question was, uh, were the German tactical games used at the unit level or at the officer NCO training arms or the special arms schools? Where, where was the, this gaming sort of resident in? Um, I'm not an expert on this, but my, my reading of that handbook is that it was uh, it was generally used at as many levels as as you would fit into the um, how can, let's see how I can put this so at the you would typically see the games played at the tactical level these this particular set of games played at the tactical level from the the platoon the I'm trying to remember if there was squad games. Yeah, there were, so there was, there were different levels of the game. So squad, squad leaders and section leaders would play a version of the game, platoon leaders a version of the game, and company commanders a version of the game. And the, the game was set up for not only the, the schoolhouses, but for the, the tactical units to use them in garrison when they had time. Now, in 19, I don't think they had a lot of time at the, at the unit level. I think a lot of the preceding years had been spent teaching the, the NCOs and the junior officers to think through tactical problems. And in 1940, by that time, a lot of it was being done in field exercises where they were, they were focused on taking the theoretical learning and applying it to real people on real ground. So the next question is, I understand it is crucial to decide appropriate scenarios before conducting a good war game. So how do we choose the best scenario for future strategy? Basically, I understand there are two basic options. Most likely one, uh, the most likely one, and the most dangerous one. The former is easy to find comparably, but the latter is the big problem. Also, someone tried to choose a scenario based on what he or she have, have some intention for the outcome. How can we solve for this problem? Well, I, I'll, I'm honestly, I, I've never been a big fan of most dangerous, uh, most likely. Uh, and I think that the, the, the fundamental problem is that the story of the scenario gets set too soon. And what you, what you wanna do is not write a scenario so much as you wanna pose a situation. For, let me see if I can, can gen up a difference here. So um, here, here's a scenario based game, right? We're, we're gonna have a, uh, a, a uh, let, me try, let me try an army example for a change. We're going to have a, a tank platoon. Uh, no, that's too small. So the tank company is uh, given the mission to advance down this road and capture this um, hill, hill, hill crest overlooking uh, the line of advance of the battalion that's coming up behind. That's a scenario. The situation story is that you're the company commander and you've been given the task to advance down this road. And we're, we're in a broader situation where we don't know exactly what's gonna be happening. 
And that's not that very, that's not a very good example, unfortunately. But I guess uh, if I can think it through for a second. The what I'm what I envision is that the the story is more open that the players are given some guidance in the, both the general and specific situations, but not so much tactical direction from above that they're limited in their ability to think through the problem from first principles. Uh, that's the best I can do, I'm afraid. Not very satisfying, I'm sorry. No, I think it's a good answer in the sense of you want to scope the situation that the story is relevant and the, the players have enough information to to act in your game, but not so much that you're already sort of scripted the, the ending, right? Um, so the next question is undoubtedly the one of the key debates in our community is um, someone asks if you have a preference towards computer-based simulation games and all the calculations they can do. Yep. <laughs> Or um, you, tabletop. You blank, oh, can you, you hear me? You blanked out there, Seb. Yeah, you, you blanked out there when you just after you started to ask the question, so I didn't hear it. Oh yeah, no worries. So this is a uh, question about if you have a preference towards computer-based simulation games and all the calculations they can do, or do uh, or a tabletop board game which permits on-the-spot adaptation and human interaction. Uh, well, personally, I have a preference for tabletop games, but the, the, uh, the power of electronic versions of games is one that can be very important to use. That's why what I was, uh, what I'm, what I'm, you know, meditating on is the way to put it, I guess, or proposing uh, as a challenge is to come up with something that can be implemented both ways. And the, I, I, I was brought up in the, uh, how shall I put this? If you're gonna do computer programs for multimedia applications, whether they're games or other things, you, you really wanna have a paper prototype because the paper prototype lets you uh, see your mistakes and fix them before you start cutting electrons. Because once you start cutting electrons, it becomes very, very difficult to change. And so what I have in mind here is exactly that, where you've got a tabletop game that's simple enough, yet has enough fidelity to be interesting. And then you can convert that into a, a I, I like to think of it as a tablet game in which you take the basic concepts and, and think of that as the basic game, right? But then you can layer on all sorts of additional details and additional complications that the computer can handle that eventually will, will uh, crush the weight of the paper to tabletop game with too much, for the, too much overhead for the players. The, the problem with, with all games really is how much overhead of fiddling around do the players have to do, 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 deal with in order to play the game. In board games of the traditional hex and counter type, that overhead is enormous. You can never get a, a normal military officer or, or enlisted person who is not a gamer already. You can never get them to play those games because that's you got to learn, you know, from from ten to forty pages of rules just to make the game work. That's crazy. Uh, I, I I've learned my profession. And I can do my profession. I don't understand all this crap because it's all abstract. Hey, Peter. So, so Peter, I think we lost you for a second. Uh, well, that seems fair. I lost you for a second. So. <laughs> Um, well, let me summarize that. Uh, my, my basic concept was that something that's simple enough to be played as a board game, then translated into something like a tablet game. And then the tablet game can serve as the basis for layering on all sorts of additional complications and details. 
Oh, absolutely. And there are some interesting applications of using uh, phone apps with in combination with tabletop gaming. The example that comes to mind is uh, U-Boat by Phalanx Game, which uses a phone app really cleverly in its tabletop design. Uh, yeah, yeah. Some of the escape games are like that, too. So our next question is, what uh, electronic or digital game would you recommend currently for Congress and civilians to gain an understanding of how best to integrate the three T's in modern and emerging theater of conflict? I'm not sure what the three T's are referred to. If someone, um, whoever asked that question, could you just pop in your uh, clarification? Well, those are the three T's to victory, Seb. Tactics, ah, okay. technology, and, and training. Yeah. Um, oh, good grief. Congress? Yeah, I don't know. There was a, there was a, um, I think there was an article in the last couple months uh, at, in uh, War on the Rocks about Congress, about the Naval Naval War College needed to bring Congress up to Newport and have them play games so that they could understand what was going on, and uh, that was that was just crazy talk. I mean, if you've ever if, if you ever had any contact with the guys at the Naval War College, when they have to deal with the, with the Congress critters, it's un, it's unpleasant because typically they have to jump through thousands of hoops and spin a lot, and then they they cancel the uh, visit gets canceled at the last minute. So, uh, I think I think one of the the things that can possibly contribute is to, to start them with a, um, an idea that I've had for, for a long time now, but I've never been able to implement. And, and the idea is to take a, like a, um, a large scale game. So a, a, a seminar game, say of, of 50 to 100 people that plays through an important situation and comes up with some uh, insights. And then in, typically when those games are done, there's a report written and some, maybe some briefings given and it's all very cut and dried and it's boring, boring, boring. And what, what always struck me as potentially a very productive approach was to take the game as it was played and then distill it down to a couple of key decision points and present that to the, to the briefing audience in terms of, well, here's the situation and it's evolved to this point. And um, during the game, the, the players had to make these decisions. What decisions might you make? How would you think about this problem in, in this game? You don't have to make decisions, just talk through those decisions. And then once you've had that conversation, then you can explain this is what happened in the game and you can go to the next point. I think people that are naive to games don't understand what, they're, what they are and how they work and what they can do. And they're never gonna understand those things without participating in one, but they're never gonna participate in one until you can give them some idea of what it's like. And I think that approach can do that. If only there were an opportunity to do so with incoming administration, for example. So on that note about a new administration and new senior leaders, what design principles might you use to create a war game that helps leaders um, I'm assuming both civilian and military, contemplate theories or theory of victory in a short amount of time, given that since most senior leaders only have a scarce amount of time for allocated for gaming. Well, I think that, that what I just described is really probably the most potentially productive way of doing it. They, they never have enough time to do anything, right? And so the only way that you can, can get them to commit the time to actually think through a problem is to take advantage of a situation in which they have the time to do that. Um, 
I remember a, a presentation that uh, uh, Dick Cheney gave at a, a Army strategy conference up in Carlisle, which he said that policy gets made when there's a speech that has to be given. So it may be that the, the way to get people in senior positions to pay attention to the ideas of behind games is to present them something like that uh, when there's a when there's a specific situation that's arisen that they have to give a presentation or a talk or a speech at some some place I, I don't know I, I don't have a solution to the problem of getting the politicians that God help us we we hire to run our country to actually do a good job of doing that. So the next question is, what is your perspective of high operational war games that include near peer adversaries that do not entail or include um, the diplomatic information or economic portions of the dying sort of paradigm and mostly focus on the military? Well, I, th I think they, they have their uses if the focus is on the military. But then if in that case, all the rest of that important framework has to be provided as the context of the game. Uh, you, you can play high operational games without reference to economics, for example, unless the economics are what the game is, what the war and the conflict is all about. Uh, I, I think you can do, you can do just about anything. You can focus on the military, you can focus on the diplomatic, you can focus on the economic. It, it can be useful to integrate all of them but the integration that takes place is most effective when the integration is the people, when the, the operators have to meet and interact with the other sides, the other aspects of power, right? When the, when the, the admirals have to talk to the, the ambassadors and the ambassadors have to talk to the, to the economists and the economists have to talk to the uh, information technologists who tell them that all the crazy ideas that they've got will never work because the, the whole internet is gonna come down tomorrow. Um, it's, it's the interaction of the people that matter as far as the dime goes. The interaction of the, the elements of power is managed by people. So the next question is, um, in reference to balancing strategies and the concept of acceptable losses or costs. How do you incorporate acceptable costs as a game mechanic? Even as an abstraction, how do we understand well enough what can be considered acceptable for US policymakers or more broadly the American populace? Well, there are basically two ways, right? You either dictate it. It's like you've got X number of victory points that you lose for every ship lost or every division that takes 10% casualties or something. Uh, that's, that's the sort of classic abstract uh, way of quantifying things that are not really quantifiable. But in reality, what's acceptable is what's acceptable to people. And so if you, if you want to understand how people will react, you need to incorporate people into the problem. And so the, the idea would be that you need to have some number of, of people representing the reaction of the population or of the leadership. It's easier with leadership because you just have them play the game. And if it's the people, you have to have somebody to represent the, the people, usually by doing something that's like a pulp. And you can, you can do, do a, a sort of a straw poll with some numbers of um, participants to get their reactions to things. But the problem, the problem with, with acceptable losses and acceptable things like that is it all depends, right? It depends on what's at stake. It depends on just how high the cost is. And so it's, it's, you can do a lot of gamer tricks to try to represent that by quantifying things that ultimately are not quantifiable, or you can use people 
to represent the not quantifiable. Also, uh, a method that I've seen in the past and I've used as well is that you just like with my students, I do iterative games where I create different uh, uh, strategic objectives or requirements in which like if you lose X number of your fleet, you know, you lose automatically it's stealing from old you know, Avalon Hill games. Uh, but you just change those sort of strategic parameters uh, between iterations and you see how their strategies and thinking can change. Um, and that's an interesting way to go about it as well. Um, so the next question is a question that we get quite often in our seminars is, what do you think is the biggest challenge when considering the cyber domain in war games? Well, I think the biggest challenge is that for me is I don't really understand enough of the technical side of it to grasp a lot of the, the, the tactical level cyber stuff. And, and I think ultimately the problem with the whole concept of cyber in, in games or in policy is that we don't have any experience that is wide enough to give us something to hang our hats on. Um, so you can, you can spin up all sorts of ideas and stories, but you have a limited uh, set of resources about what's actually happened and what's actually possible. And a lot of it is, they say you can do X, but they really can't. But that's a skeptic's position. So um, I think it's the lack of information and the lack of understanding that's the challenge. So the next question involves uh, our adversaries. So we talk a lot about our own war gaming and how we uh, can prepare for future conflict or future challenges. Do you have any idea if our adversaries um, also increase their use of wargaming in their militaries and their PME systems? Uh, well, yeah, I, I mean, the, the Chinese have, um, over the last 10 years, have dramatically increased their uh, uses of wargaming and of uh, at-sea exercises, and exercises in general, for that matter. Um, they, <laughs> I, I was shocked and amazed, uh, God, I don't know, 10 years ago when um, my friend Ding Cheng, uh, who is a Chinese space expert primarily, came back from a visit over there and presented me an opportunity to look at the Chinese version of my book. And uh, I was shocked and amazed to see that they actually uh, cited well, actually, it wasn't the Chinese version of my book. It was a Chinese book on wargaming that, that extracted chunks of, of my book, particularly the cycle of research and some other graphics, and gave full credit for that. And, and maybe four or five years ago, um, Major Tom Moat from the UK Army was invited to go to China and give them lectures on wargaming and run some Matrix games for them. So they're... they're they're doing a lot of uh, integrating of wargaming into their thinking. And I, I believe that's the case in the Soviet, Soviet Union. You can tell how old I am. Uh, I think the Russians are doing a lot too, but I don't know enough about that. I think Stephen Downs Martin has actually been trying to conduct some um, data gathering and research to understand what's going on in our adversaries. Another name I would mention uh, when you're thinking about uh, Chinese wargaming is Elsa Kanya up at Harvard. She's doing some very interesting work in uh, looking at how the PLA sort of train and educate their officers and enlisted, uh, including wargaming. Um, so the next question is, do you think civilian organizations could use wargaming to better uh, plan stabilization operations, i.e. how to use their assets and dollars at the tactical, operational, and strategic levels of peace? Oh my gosh. Can anybody think that it would not have been helpful to have played through the vaccine distribution with a game? It's, it's, it's maddening. You could certainly think about how you could set up a game to deal with the, all of the bureaucratic, political, and media issues associated with something like the vaccine distribution. 
But it's clear, the evidence is clear that nobody in the positions of authority in this region had the first clue about what they were doing when this happened. And, and it's, it's just, it's maddening, it's maddening. So yes, I think civilian organizations can do and learn a lot from gaming for dealing with their problems. If they have the right attitude and are willing to put themselves on the line and say, okay, we're gonna do this game and we're gonna make decisions as if we were actually faced with these decisions. And then let's talk through what the possible outcomes are. So yeah, I think it's, in fact, I think it's becoming more and more urgent in this society that we do that kind of gaming with civilian organizations. It's also of mention is like State Department is um, steadily or, or at least slowly embracing gaming as a method. Um, I know they are using gaming at small levels to look at disinformation operations and sort of whole society sort of challenges in terms of hybrid threats as well. Um, yeah, State Department used to used to do, they, they made some pretty important contributions, I thought, to gaming back in the 80s. They had a couple folks up there that, that knew what they were doing and they, they ran an interesting conference or two. And then as usual, in, in a lot of these cases, the, the champions of the technique uh, either uh, age out or rotate out and there's no, it's, it's like the seed falling on stony ground and there's no, no follow on to it. On that note, um, I, this is a question that I'm particularly interested in that whoever asked this, thank you. Uh, the US Air Force Academy recently stood up a strategy and warfare center and is building an immersive multi-domain lab with the ability to engage in scenarios and war games at all levels of war, which is awesome, by the way. Um, the lab has theater ops, uh, operational level stations, as well as simulators for the tactical level from air spice, uh, airspace and cyber. Um, but if you had a blank slate to work with Peter, what advice would you give to the Air Force Academy and the center uh, on how you would approach this opportunity to educate cadets through wargaming? Let's see, let's see. This would be 30 years ago now. There it was like right after Desert Storm, there was a game convention in Baltimore. Uh, it was either it was either uh, Origins or or Avalon Con. I can't remember which it was at the time. And at that convention, there were presentations by an Air Force captain and a civilian contractor from the Air Force Academy, and they had a vision. And their vision was to build the hollow deck from the Starship Enterprise. And their idea was almost exactly described the way you just described what they're doing at the Air Force Academy now. That they wanted to create a situation in which students could be immersed in a decision-making process and environment and play through various decisions that they might make. They had some interesting examples. They they. They proposed a game which I think ultimately, uh, I don't know whether it influenced this, but the design for, um, what was it called? Uh, Wings for the Red Baron. One of the games that they talked about at this convention was a game in which the players were focused on developing aircraft for the German Air Force in World War I. And, working through all the technologies and building game, building prototype uh, aircraft electronically using that technology. So I think that they, they can do no worse than to, to retain and, and reinstitute institute that vision of the holodeck for the enterprise. I, I think that's the way to go. I love it, I love it. Um, so the next question is, what game that you participated in the last, let's say, two or three years did you enjoy the most? And was it transferable to policy or real, real world problem solving? Well, um, I have not played in a professional DOD game 
for the past three years or four years. Um, so I'm, I'm having trouble coming up with anything that I could use to answer that question. Um, what was the what was the functional part of that? Something that was transferable. Transferable to like I'm assuming like policy impact or have some kind of insight to operations. But I guess we can just broadly generalize the question to also include like what is a hobby game or a commercial game that you thought was insightful and why. Well, I'll tell you what, let, let me let me answer that by going a, a little bit farther back. And um, I'm gonna, one of, the, one of the games that I'm most proud of um, doing at CNA was a game called uh, Separating Sudan. This was a game that took place in, uh, I think it was 2012. And it was designed to explore various possible directions that the separation of South Sudan from Sudan might take over the, the immediate future. This was right after there was an agreement that there would be a separate South Sudan. And we, we did a game with representatives from DOD, state, um, CENTCOM, or I'm sorry, AFRICOM and um, Sud Sudanese expats and uh, actual South Sudanese officials. And we, we did this game to explore what might happen and how things might evolve on the basis of what we knew at the time. And I think that game, which was focused on building the support for strategic service, strategic analyses that was uh, popular in the Pentagon at the, at the time. I think that game actually did a, a very interesting job of, of helping the participants articulate some of the future directions that things might go. And my recollection was that over the next couple of years, we saw some of those uh, projections, shall we call them, or, or speculations, uh, come pretty close to being true. So the, the point of that story is that when you get knowledgeable people who actually have a stake in something that's going on or might go on, and you present them with a uh, vivid and immersive situation in which they're called on to think through and make decisions, they can, in fact, influence the future, both their own future and the future of policies by different governments. But it's, it all comes down to the effectiveness of getting the people to participate and engage in the problem. So I think that's that kind of thing doesn't require a lot of technology. What it requires is a lot of research and a lot of understanding and the ability to pull those storylines together and draw them out of the participants. So I, I think that that is a, a relatively easy way of, uh, that's, a, that's the wrong way of putting it. It wasn't easy, but it, it's, a, it's a relatively non-technical way of penetrating into the, the heart of critical thinking and critical policies. So the next question involves, have you come across any games that focus on non-combat or non-military activities uh, related to like security force assistance, foreign military sales and other activities that can be used during uh, so-called like competition stage? Uh, 
I'm having trouble thinking of any. Uh, I know that that uh, I know that I think Rex Brennan and, and some of the folks in the UK have done work on security force assistance, but I, I I'm not familiar with it. So one of the things I wanted to ask is that. In your one of your earlier slides that you showed a picture of Assassin's Mace and Harpoon, and I believe I think Hornet Leader, uh, among others. Um, why do you think why so, educational gaming sort of like you know, I mean, fades away after a time, like thinking about Dunkamp, uh, the game that um, the army used for quite a long time for training? And how can we, you know, I mean, how can we prepare not how can we create the sort of like fertile ground that you mentioned that sort of the educational gaming at the tactical edge sort of remains fertile and like you know, continuing? Well, I think it's the, it's the problem that uh, the whole idea of uh, establishing a new sort of way of doing things goes through some stages. And the, the first stage is when you've got the heroes, right? The, the guys and girls and who get in there and, and they're really enthusiastic and they're, they're, they get things started. Um, in fact, I, there, was a, there was a paper I read. I'm so old, I don't remember. It was about software development. It talked about the phases of building a software development division in a company, for example, in which first you have, you have a few people who are champions and they, they get things done, but then you have to build up a body of, of shall we say, disciples that become the, the next generation and expand on the capabilities of the, the, the champions. But things don't really change until the processes become set as regular, the regular way of doing business. So we've, we've run into this situation where you've got a few champions and there's more of them now, right? So we've got disciples and we've got champions and some, some gaming has penetrated into places like the academies. And certainly there's still, there's gaming that's been going on in Newport and the Army War College for, for decades. But they're, they're narrow, right? It, it's, they tend to be fairly narrowly focused. And in particular, because of the way things are funded these days, they, they, even though the Army War College and the Navy War College they tend to do games that attract attention from flags or are done because flags request them. Until the whole process of games in education becomes an established tool, there's always going to be the danger that ultimately it's going to die out. And so the, the way that it can, the only way that it can grow is to develop and demonstrate over and over until the process lives without the people. As long as everything depends on who is doing it and where they're doing it, you got a problem. It won't last. But it's like any other academic discipline, right? If there was no process for incorporating operations research, for example, into a curriculum in schools. And it all depended on the handful of guys who served in World War II to teach the next generation the wonders of operations research. If it hadn't progressed into a discipline that was embodied in some ways in the Pentagon, but also grew 
in industry, then th that whole technique would have become a historical aberration. And so we're, we're, we've got that same situation with wargaming. If wargaming is going to become a standard tool that can be used broadly, not just by the military, but by civilians, by companies, by educators, it, it's, it has to develop into a discipline that can be taught and learned. And, and we know that the, the people at King's College are trying to do that now. It's a, it's a long uphill fight and they just have to, you know, they just have to be, keep doing it. We've seen video games as the, the term of art become more mainstream. And there's now schools that teach game design and they're focused on video games, digital games. Right? It may be that, that trying to use simple tabletop games is a hopeless, hopeless cause. I, I don't think so, but I could be wrong because I'm an old guy, you know, I, why not? But leveraging the, the academic credentials of the video game, digital game uh, education system may be our best hope. Uh, even that is a problem. We, we tried, Ed McGrady and Una Wong and I tried to get some programs going at uh, George Mason and uh, Virginia Tech. And it, it was, it was uh, a very difficult uphill struggle and we failed. So um, it's hard, it's hard. But you well, know you're, that Yes, and well, you're always welcome here at Georgetown, Peter. Uh, we always appreciate your insights. Um, so I believe I have one last question, but it's quite a long one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so let me give me a moment as I parse this out. Okay, so I'm a apologies to the author because I'm going to shorten this. Um, our dime decision mark uh, decision making process is seldom joined up, and the technological edge tends to be via synthesis of systems uh, which cross organizational boundaries of control. Is your focus on the three T's uh, of wargaming with the emphasis of tactical excellence intended as a band aid? We can't fix that problem with wargaming, but we can fix this one sort of approach or a Pareto solution if, if we fix this problem, uh, th that one is manageable or has he or she missed this point? I don't know what to say about that. I, the, the, the idea that I had of these three T's I didn't really think about it in reference to the integration and synthesis of DIME. Uh, it, it came out of what I described, right? It was looking at um, the history and realizing that these were the things that I saw historically and that I felt were useful ways of thinking about problems that we need to address today. In the context of DIME, I hadn't really thought of that. Um, but but I, it seems like it seems like there's some possibility there that if we think through the processes of connecting the, the technical, tactical and training, we're going to have to think through the processes of integrating the technologies, tactics, and training across not only a particular warfare area, but across the entire uh, national um, project, um, pop, 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 instruments of power. So I, I guess that, that I think that there is something that can be gained there from from that that thinking through that process 
I hope that's not as inarticulate as it sounded. No, I think it's good. Thank you, Peter. Um, so I think there's a question that asked, have you read um, Jeff Applegate <coughs> and Burke's um, latest book, The Craft of Wargaming? And uh, if so, can you share your impressions of it? Um, I, I, read, I read it in draft form before it was published, obviously. Um, and I had, I made many suggestions to Jeff uh, and it seems like a lot of them they took. So obviously uh, where they took my suggestions, it was brilliant. Um, but I haven't, I haven't read cover to cover the final version of the book, but I think that the concept that, you know, I wrote the art of war gaming Stephen Downs Martin kept kicking me. Somebody should write the science of war gaming, but I never even thought of writing the craft of war gaming. And I think that that Jeff's perspective on that way of thinking about war gaming is an important element of making a, a, a broad and balanced view of just what it is that we all do, um, because we do a lot of different things, and. So thinking, the more we can get people to think about what we do and what they do and how they all fit together, the better off we are. So I, I think it's a book that, that just about everyone in the professional community um, should be at least familiar with, if not buy a copy. And I don't get any royalties from it. So it's, um, it's an un, un, uh, unbiased perspective. I actually have a, a copy of the book, The Craft of Wargaming, on my desk right next to me right now. I'm about uh, two thirds way through. Um, so the last question, which I I, I reserve for myself uh, for each of these webinars, is: You just finished your uh, Austerlitz game, which is on Kickstarter. Um, do you have another game project in in mind for the next one, or if so, if not, um, what is a game that you wish you can design in the future? And why? Well, I actually, I actually have a couple of projects uh, ongoing. Um, Battles Magazine is supposedly going to publish a game on the, the Battle of Chickamauga, and um, Worthington uh, Publishing has agreed in principle to publish the game on Hanu that I talked about at the beginning of the of the presentation. And uh, I've also got a, uh, a game um, concept that Compass Games is um, anxious for me to get to work on, a quadra, a quadra game on the American Civil War, on four battles from the American Civil War. Uh, I've done the basic uh, research for that, but I haven't actually created counters and pieces yet. So that's still uh, up in the air. Um, the game I'd like to do, frankly, is, is the tactical naval game that I just described earlier. And I don't know that I'm going to be doing, doing that. I'm, I'm feeling like I'm uh, so far out of the loop on what's going on in the Navy in the last couple of years that I don't think my expertise uh, has, um, is up to that. But so, um, Aside from that, the I, I've got a lot of Napoleonic games that I could do as a follow-on to the, the Kickstarter game, and I'm hoping that uh, that that if people like that, um, we'll try to get some more out. You know, Peter, uh, I remember in a discussion we had, you mentioned and you, you challenged me about the notion of creating a simple educational na modern naval game, and that that simple conversation that we had about it has literally kept me up some nights. Um, like it's been wrapped, I've been wrapping my brain around the axle thinking about it. And every time I think about it, it makes it more complicated. So thank you for you know, taking hours of sleep from me, uh, what little I have left. But thank you everyone for such a robust discussion. And thank you, Peter, for your, your, uh, your insights and a great presentation. And I want to welcome you to come back again in the future. And I've never met someone who's retired that works so much. Um, so thank you again, uh, and have a good night, everyone.